Following the emergence of the COVID cluster in Block 506 Hogang, uh, we look at how it all started. Now, the first case, a 57-year-old Malaysian national who stayed at Block 506 was identified on the 15th of May. Uh, within a few days, four more cases were uncovered and a cluster was declared. But it wasn't named after the Hogang block yet. A day later, another case was identified. Authorities then announced compulsory testing for all residents living in Block 506. Uh, they said a few COVID cases were identified to be living there. Uh, three days after that, a second cluster linked to a case living in the block was announced. And this was followed by the emergence of a third cluster linked to another case in the block. At the end of May, compulsory testing was announced for two neighbouring blocks, 501 and 507. A virus fragments had been detected in the wastewater there. Over 800 residents and visitors were tested. One positive case was detected. Now, just on Thursday, another case linked to Block 506 was detected through surveillance. Combined with three previously identified clusters, it formed a new Block 506 Hogang Avenue 8 cluster with 13 cases. And this prompted authorities to ask residents at Block 506 uh, to undergo mandatory testing for a second time. Well, shopkeepers in seven nearby blocks will also be tested, while residents and visitors there can go for voluntary testing. All seven blocks are within a 12-minute walk from Block 506. Well, let's take a closer look now. And for that, we're joined by Associate Professor Janelle Thompson, who is working with authorities on wastewater surveillance and infectious diseases expert, Dr. Leo Leong Ho Nam. Now, uh, Dr. Leong, let's start with you. Uh, we've known about the cases at Block 506 Hogang for some weeks now. Uh, why have authorities designated it a cluster just now? And what difference does that make? Actually, the fact that it's, there are many cases just tells you there's a cluster. And the fact that there are more and more buildings that are involved, it just shows you that um, it's spreading. And it's spreading by close proximity. When you actually use the word cluster, it tells you that there's a close proximity spreading and there would be a lot more people coming up from there. And you think there might have been a super spreading event. But in this case, I think there possibly were several spread, super spreading events that led to so many cases. Dr. Yong, the health ministry says that viral fragments were found in the wastewater samples at some of the Hogang blocks. Our sanitary systems are presumably water and air tight. So is this even a plausible mode of transmission in the estate? And if not, what could the likeliest cause of transmission be? My money is not on the wastewater. And in fact, back in SARS 2003 was really popular. That about the Amoy Gardens, where you could actually spread by the ventilation. But the system in Singapore and the way it runs is really very different. If you look into your toilet bowl, you see a layer of water. And that layer of water is your protection from the stink of the waste. And that also prevents the virus from coming out. So I'm really quite happy that it's not coming from the ventilation and certainly not from the wayside, but it might actually come from close proximity leaving, living. So we, we have people in the 12 minutes to well, walk radius and they would meet, they could actually meet and just sit out in the open or actually engage in some sort of small talk and in turn actually pass a virus transmission. My money, my suspect is actually in that lift, the car lift which goes up and down to take us to different floors. It is an enclosed space and then you realise that between movements, the doors were closed and the fans were shut off. It is stagnant air and it's the perfect environment for virus to spread. And honestly, many people would just throw their guards down when the doors close, mask down, take a drink, and in turn, you could actually spread within the lift and the next person who comes in will get your breath of fresh air and then the dose of virus. Uh, Professor Thompson, is that a view that you would agree with or do you feel that the viral fragments found in the wastewater samples at some of the blocks could still be infectious? Well, so far, there are no reports that infectious SARS-CoV-2 virus can be isolated from wastewater. And in fact, a recent study by a team in Paris shows that 
the majority of the viral fragments that are detected in the wastewater by the standard RNA-based tests um, were actually just naked RNA, and that's the virus's genetic material. So why don't we see infectious viruses in sewage? Well, we know from hand-washing campaigns, for example, that strong detergents are the enemy of these enveloped viruses like SARS-CoV-2, and they cause them to break apart. And our guts naturally make strong detergents that are called bile acids that help us digest our food, and then they're excreted with feces. And wastewater also contains additional detergents from washing. So an activation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus by these detergents might explain part of the reason why uh, researchers haven't found infectious SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. And one study that I find somewhat reassuring is uh, the U.S. Centers of Disease Control survey of wastewater workers, where they didn't find any excess risk of COVID-19 infection in that population who are routinely exposed to aerosols from sewage. But I don't think we'll ever be able to say there's zero risk of contracting the disease through wastewater. In fact, we know that wastewater uh, is a transmission route for many infectious diseases. And it's worth noting that most of our understanding of SARS-CoV-2 risk uh, today in sewage is based on data from early in the pandemic uh, before the variants of concern emerged. So um, it's possible that a variant could emerge that's more transmissible from wastewater. But to be clear, I'm really not aware of any evidence of this to date. So even though infectious SARS-CoV-2 has not been found in the wastewater, we still need to maintain high safety standards when we handle the wastewater uh, and not let our guard down. Professor Thompson, wastewater surveillance is such an important screening tool in determining you know, those individuals who might be shedding virus. And, and we have had reports of people shedding virus fragments long after they've, been, they've recovered. So your team conducts that wastewater surveillance on a regular basis. How does this impact the team's reading or assessment of the risk that there is in, in specific areas? Yes, you're right. There are uh, many reports that show people shedding low levels of SARS-CoV-2 viral fragments in feces for weeks after their initial infection and even after the person's no longer contagious and is cleared to go home. So uh, viral RNA from these non-infectious individuals could still be picked up when uh, tests are conducted in the wastewater. But I would actually argue that this type of detection doesn't affect the reading on risk because getting a signal from the SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the building's wastewater is basically an alert. And it's, it tells you to look more closely at a specific area and then to decide in light of the available information if more targeted screening is, is merited to track down uh, potential viral circulation. And Dr. Leon, Singapore reported seven new community cases today. That is the, the lowest in about three weeks. Uh, looking at the trajectory of the cases in recent days, what's your take on whether we can perhaps relax restrictions by next weekend? I'm actually very excited with the numbers that have come down. We are talking about single digits now, but more importantly, what the Singaporeans should be looking at is the number of unlinked cases. We've been having less than five unlinked cases practically for all the days for the last seven days. That's a prediction of what's going to happen for the next seven days. If this goes on till the end of the weekend, where we have less than two or three unlinked cases, I'm really optimistic for the last leg of this uh, phase two uh, with enhanced surveillance. But, okay, I'm going to be a little bit cautious. I used to be very optimistic, but I'm going to be a little bit cautious in terms of opening. How much can we open up to? Well, um, this virus is really taking us by surprise. It's really highly infectious. We're talking about transmissibility that is unheard of, unseen of in the last year. So if we're going to open up, I suggest we could do it slowly and dining in at an air-conditioned restaurant. I don't see that coming up very quickly anytime soon. So slow opening is probably going to be the order of the day after the 13th of June. Go slow. Well, thank you both for your thoughts there. Uh, we've been speaking with Associate Professor Janelle Thompson from uh, NTU and infectious diseases expert Dr. Leong Ho Nam.